Hello, hello, good evening. Welcome everybody um, back to uh, another Tortoise Thinking. I'm Liz Mosley. Um, you're very welcome to be here. If this is your first thinking, I'll do a bit of blurb in a sec to let you know how this all works and what we're going to try and do this evening. And if you've been to a thousand uh, of these before, that's a good opportunity for you to take a minute and go and get yourself a drink, do whatever you want to do. Um, because you know what this is. So I'm not meant to have favourites, but I'm secretly really pleased um, that I got to do this one because we're joined this evening by um, a really brilliant person that it says in my notes is a national treasure. And I think that that is true. Um, the exciting and the rather wonderful poet, playwright, performer, all round um, amazing person who is Lem Sisse. Ta-da! <laughs> yes! See that! It was, it was seamless, Lem. It was like we planned it. Thank you so much for being here. Um, welcome to Tortoise. This is a thinking. Um, so as I was saying just before we let everybody in, um, as they're still trickling in and settling down, Lem and I will have a chat for a, for a little while. We're going to talk about your book, um, which is out now in paperback, My Name is Why. And, um, and then we'll open the conversation out to other stuff that we think is interesting. And people who are listening to us, um, please do join in. Um, put up your little blue digital hand if you can find it in the participants button. If you'd like to come on and talk to Lem or chat with my colleague Ellie. There's Ellie. Say hello, Ellie. Hello. Ellie is in the chat this evening um, sort of marshalling and monitoring your comments. And um, if you haven't yet read, uh, bought Lem's latest uh, book, his um, uh, memoir, My Name is Why, um, it came out in 2019, it's out now in paperback, then Ellie's just posted a link to it there. Lem, um, the book, there's a little section early on in the book, a little sentence, the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you found out why. And your, your name literally is why you discover. Tell us a bit about literally the name thing, because the name part is a really important part of this book. Yeah, I, I, I found out that my name was Lem Sisse when I left care at 18 years of age when I was given my birth certificate. So it was an administrative responsibility for the care services to give the birth certificate to somebody who was responsible for me. But the, there was nobody responsible for me, so it had to be given to me. And the name that I thought was mine up until then was Norman. Yeah. That is uh, Norman Mark Greenwood. Yeah. So when I received my birth certificate, I it it it, it asked it, it begged the question why why did you call me Norman Mark Greenwood? Why do I not have any family? Where is my mother and my father? Do I have sisters and brothers? Why would this happen? Mm. I. Uh, I was, that was at 18, but I was 29 when I first went to Ethiopia and it was in Ethiopia. In fact, I was, it was in Ethiopia that I was told, how do you spell your name? L-E-M-N, um, as is what I said. And then you, do you know what that means? And a few people said it to me without telling me. And, um, uh, and then, I think it was my mother's husband, who wasn't my father, <laughs> who said, your name means why, the question why. And it's, in Ethiopia, it's not said Lem, it's said Lemen. Mm. Um, so when, uh, whenever I meet Ethiopians, uh, they will say Lemen. And <laughs> it makes my heart melt. Because yeah. once I knew that, that was my name. When I found the name on the birth certificate, I thought it was a spelling mistake. But it couldn't have been a spelling mistake because my mother's letters spell my name in exactly the same way. Mm. And when the social worker wrote to my mother, he called me Lem when I was a baby. Yeah. He called me Lem, but he'd already changed my name to Norman. Yeah. It must have felt like a very 
and I can't imagine being your name is something that's so personal to you you sort of embody your name people say you know when the baby was born I could see she was a Claire you know all this stuff people say it must have felt so strange to be a man and to have been Norman and then you're not Norman well <laughs> I sort of want to go back to the beginning yeah, I, do. So I can sort of contextualize this is, yeah. it, is it okay yeah of course you should, absolutely because my mum came to this country uh, to study and then she was intending to go back to Ethiopia which she she did but she found herself pregnant like a lot of women did and still do <laughs> uh, and um, she was placed by the college that she was at in a mother and baby home in the north of England uh, so she came from Berkshire to the north of England and it was in the mother and baby's home that the social worker was determined that I should be adopted, mm. not uh, fostered. My mother said to the social worker, I only want him fostered. I want him to come home with me when I go back to Ethiopia after I've finished my studies, I need help. Um, but he gave me to foster parents and said to them, treat this as an adoption, he's yours forever. But technically he has to be adopted, fostered, because we can't get this woman to sign the adoption papers. Mm. So what my mum did is she landed in England while it was in a sort of, uh, while it, it had these sort of baby farming factories, the mother and baby homes, yeah. all over the country. I've researched this and, and so has Steve Coogan. And that is exactly what the film Philomena is all about. Mm -hmm. So these mother and baby homes were often run by nuns but it was the social workers that would team up with the, uh, uh, the mother and baby homes to get those women at their most vulnerable, remember, to sign the adoption papers. Women just on the bridge between childhood and adulthood. Mm. And it's also worth remembering that these institutions would not be built if it were not for our prejudice. You know, it's very easy to look at the, what's happened in the past and blame the institutions, but it was our terraced houses, our twitching curtains, our semi-detached and detached houses, our judgments, our churches, and our institution, uh, our, our, the British people that allowed the, themselves to feel shame against the church and against the state. It's a very authoritarian time in many ways. And so that a woman who was pregnant without uh, a husband was seen as a kind of threat, you know, to the status quo, a sort of estrogen terrorist. And, and they were held in these mother and baby homes and many of them will never have heard of the, adopt the word adoption before this time. Many but of them were felt did. isolated. But your mum did know about adoption. You well, talk about that in the book because she specified that that was what she did not want for you is she wanted for you to be taken care of so that she could take you home um this just the structure of the book is really interesting because there comes a time much later in your life when you finally after a long battle get access to your files yeah. and so what the book does is sort of thread together with real documents the real things that were yeah. typed about you on a typewriter at the time that helped you to sort of piece together the authorities view of what was happening to you and then you could sort of compare it with what you remembered was happening to you and that's sort of how the memoir comes together those those two perspectives yes um right. it's unbelievably moving to read because it's so brutal yeah um <laughs> the files are in so for the first 18 years of my life a series of individuals who would never meet me again after I left care were writing about my life and making decisions about me so the question you have I think as a reader is um, is this right was that decision that they made right what are they doing with this child and who is this child through their eyes and, and that's a decision that only the reader can make in reading those files. 
and then reflect it to those files is me and how I feel about what I went through and what was happening in my life at the time. Mm. And you can make your own judgment as to, as to the behavior of the institutions. Now, I wrote this book after getting my files and taking the government to court yeah. for what it did to me. Mm. So I had to do that alone. Mm. I had to do with that in full knowledge that I believe that they stole my name, they stole my mother, my family from me, they imprisoned me as a child. But that's just one guy's theory. Mm. I had to get my files, and it took me 30 years to get them, to be able to see the evidence. And they didn't know I was going to do this, but immediately I approached, I found a really good lawyer on childcare. I then took them to court. That took three years. And the moment that they settled out of court, I began to write the book hmm. so that you could decide what happened to me as well. I wonder if when I was reading it, Lem, um, I'm a parent of, of, of two children. Um, they don't live with me. They live with their dad. Um, I should it, be doing this out of a glass, by the way. I'm sorry. <laughs> Please don't apologise. You've, um, you've got to sort out backstage. <laughs> it's shocking, no, isn't it? You can't get the staff. I tell no you, fruity. You said there'd be fruit <laughs> and M Ms and Skittles. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, reading it as a as a parent, um, the the thing, particularly in the first chunk, when you're living with your foster family and you're a little boy, you know, you, you left your foster family or they kicked you out when you were twelve. Um, the thing that is um, most jarring um in that as you say that sort of the decision making process as a reader well, who's right what's best you know is is that you're experiencing the world as a little boy and processing things as a little boy and i can feel you and hear you you're obviously a brilliant writer of course you know as the little lem baby well norman as it was yeah. and then the, the there's the the sort of the reports and they're grown-ups that's grown-up size looking at things um, and the, but the way you interpret your mum's behavior and the way that the grown-ups interpret your foster mum's behavior so different and and it is a, it's 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 um it's about worldview but it's also that's how it is to be a child to to not be in control and to and to have so many layers of interpretation to do of course you can't do it i wonder if you look back on that time of your life with it, knowing what you now know with anything like happiness? Do you know, just before this program, before we were here, I was, uh, I was asked to do um, inheritance tracks on Saturday Live. Oh, cool, I love that. I've been a guest on that on Saturday Live. I've written poetry for Saturday Live yeah. when it first came out, etc. But you know, I, I, I went, to listen to the inheritance track section of it and I couldn't do it and I know the producer I know the producer who asked me to do it and I called I didn't call her I said I wrote an email and then I trashed it and I just asked my agent to say I can't do it mm. but so it's difficult to look back to see anything good that happened there mm. but intellectually I know that the foster parents didn't mean what they did. Mm. I know that they tried their hardest. I know that they could not admit to themselves mm. that they were so emotionally strained that they did what families do. You know, our families are beautiful. It's a beautiful thing, family. It's full of dysfunction and that's part of its beauty. Um, denial is one of the dangerous things that happens in families and it happens in all of our families yeah. and they became what i would describe as feral because they were like if we throw this one over the boat maybe we'll survive yeah and i'm afraid that they started to look at me as a consumer of their emotional resources what is a child other than a consumer of emotional resources? Yeah, true. Commission, yeah. I wouldn't mind if they'd have said, 
um, you're just here for a short time. But they taught me that they were my mum and dad forever. Mm. And they taught me how to say mum and dad, but not just, it wasn't just implicit in, in the words mum and dad. That was it. All I knew is my birth mother did not want me and they'd saved me from poor Africa. And that fitted with their Christian narrative. I'm not against Christianity in way, any shape or form, actually. Um, that was part of their... They'd never heard anything more about Africa that, than that. And the same with the social worker who sort of... Uh, who changed my name and gave me to them. Mm. Um, this is what happens when people can't see uh, the person. They can only see their, their prejudiced, unfortunately limited view of the world. Mm. Mm. I wonder, um, as if I, I've suffered from terrible homesickness all my life, just a weird thing. And um, I don't like being away from home and I think about it and I'm rubbish at going on holiday and I quite often come home early and all of that. I just wonder how, yeah. <laughs> um, do you, do you, where is home? What, what is home? Like, do you have a feeling of home when you are in a certain place or is it people or what, where does that come from for you now? Well, I would say that wherever I am, you know, wherever I find myself, uh, that's home. I guess I would say that. Um, uh, I don't really have, um, you know, there's nowhere to go back to. Mm. Like there's no familial um, fairy circle. Mm. You know, there is no uh, shut the door and that's it. There's me and I'm, I'm happy with me. Mm. Yeah, and that's fine, but there is no, there's no relativity. It's, there's no village or town. I guess the only place, well, there's not even there, but the only place would be like Scotland, Loch Inver, where we used to go on holiday. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, it's something that I, I used to crave the, but I used to crave I used to crave what I never had. Mm. So I, 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 would, I would crave what I'd never had. That is a remembrance of the smell of the food that your mum or dad made in the kitchen. The idea of sitting down in a house, which is where your family are from. Sorry about the noise. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have those... I don't, there's nowhere to go at Christmas for family. Yeah. So, you know, there's my home and I've made that and that's, that's all well and good. And I like where I live and what have you, but I don't, I, I, I no longer miss what I don't have. Mm, mm. But like inheritance tracks, there's not a record to choose. Yeah. Yeah. To, 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 that I would inherit because I have no inheritance. Nobody's giving me anything. Yeah, yeah. Whether that's the memory or it's the... Uh, nobody's giving me anything from my childhood. Yeah. So I've always tried to... I've always tried to... Um, sometimes I pretend, you know, that there is some relativity but um, but there's there's not. <laughs> um, mean, does that does that sound? Am I sounding? Am no, I making, not 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 at all. I'm just interested to know how you because you've sort of. I mean, you've literally had to get your Miss Marple on and and piece the story together in a way. You know, it was a it was a sort of and that's. I wondered if the, the sort of the sense, the sense of home, it can be a strong thing, but as you say, it can be imaginary and rather than real. And it, it would seem to me like, I, I completely understand what you mean about missing something you never had because people are very not misty eyed about home, I suppose. Well, well, what I've come to realize is that we all are in degrees of missing something that we may never have had. We all have our losses and, 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 and actually your home is, 
who you are. Maybe, maybe you want to come home, you know, when you go away, because you want to be the person you are at home. Maybe, yeah. You know, maybe that feels safe and good, and that's, that's a great thing. Mm. And I think that I have that. I think that in myself, you know, I have home. And I think that every one of us can spend our lives hurting over what we've not got that and that's the relationship with our parents that could be a relationship with a family member mm. and that hurt is a very seductive and it's very attractive mm. and it, it we you know if you fall out with a family member your father or your mother you know you can build a whole house on that yeah. you can get a house you can get married on that you can have kids on that you know you can spend your entire life building on that thing. Mm. But what I came to realize is that one of the privileges of having a family is that you don't have to forgive. You can hold it forever. Mm. Keep peeling the onion because it will go on forever. Mm. And I think for myself, because I think for myself, I realized that actually I'm, I have the same as everybody else has got. Mm. You know, I've got a whole lot of me and a whole lot of nothing. And it's what will I choose, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's not just me, there is magic in the world. You know, there, there's a reason why people go to church, find faith, meditate, go on courses, read books on how to be a better human to yourself, etc. There's mm. a bigger, there's a bigger, there's a bigger force, I believe, that can um, help us through our anxieties. And I don't feel like mine is any worse. It's only that I've had to be a detective, just like you said. From the age of 18, all my friends, which whoever they were, they were like, screw family. I'm going to go, I'm, I'm leaving this village. Yeah. I'm never coming back here. I'm going to be a, you know, and they would go out and they would get degrees. But what they, they had a blind spot. I, I, I saw it right at the beginning. I'd say, wow, you'd be like, screw family. And then you will eat your food at your dad's and mom and dad's house. Yeah. You'd be like, screw my dad. And then you'll be asking for pocket money. Yeah. And this, this narrative that they built with their parents, I, I, I would wait because I think, oh, of course. This is the pattern of things. You depend on what you hate and you hate to depend on it. Mm. So the beauty of family is it lasts a lifetime. Yeah. So you can grow long enough. So when your child says, when you get angry with your own child and you feel, feel like, oh, I'm like my mother. Oh my God, I'm like my father. Oh my God, I know why my mum did that. Mm -hmm. My mum shouted at me for not eating my crusts. Mm -hmm. Two reasons. One, she was anorexic and I didn't know of, about it. And two, she wanted me to eat my food. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing the same thing with my own child. And the privilege of family is that you don't have to call them back. You don't have to call your mum and dad and say, look, I'm sorry. I've been carrying this guilt, this hatred, this anger for years. Yeah. And it's really been about me. Yeah. I've not resolved it. And this relativity, this going apart, separating and coming back together and separating, that's the nature of family. And so I just feel like I've had that, I've had an extraordinary experience, but I think I've had one which has learned that, that actually the loss that I've had and what I've gained is what everybody wants. You know, and it's a daily project. Yeah. You know, it doesn't because I'm speaking articulately now or not, yeah. does not mean that tomorrow I'll wake up and go, oh. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. I'm going to come, the, the chat has woken up and there's lots of people sharing things and thoughts and feelings and questions and things like that. I wonder if Karen Mosdale is there with your camera on, Karen. Are you there? You've just asked a question that I think is a nice one to put to Len to get us going. Karen. Hello. Hi. Hi, oh, hi. Nice to see hi, you. Hi, Len. Hi. Yes, I just um, wondered, um, as an adopted person myself, how yep. 
Lem, feel how you feel about telling and retelling your story and if that helps in any way. It's a really good um, Yeah. Um, I get, uh, I'm proud to say uh, I am a, I'm a, an advert or not uh, for therapy. So, mm. you know, it's really important for me that we should look after ourselves, like uh, physically. I, by the way, I put on that lockdown, you know, way. physically and uh, emotionally. Those are yeah. really, and, and I think, so, sorry, the reason I say that is that if you, to tell my story and to respect myself and the audience, I must try to be well and, and that can't be through telling my story. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. It, does. You, it does, it does, yeah. I don't think telling your story necessarily makes you well or is, is even cathartic. It may be at the first time, but actually it's really important, I, important we look after ourselves through this, through the rapids of memory. So you're not just telling it, you're telling it but you're also processing it or having help to process that too no. so it's not it's not just you telling your story no, no, no. i just be really clear there are two strands here one is i try to look after myself through therapy two is i'm an artist and i i need to tell that story because right. it's been a hidden story so i get very i, I think I get very little in, from telling the story in, in the books and in the, no, that's not true. As an artist, telling the story is a must for me. Yeah. Um, as, a, as a vulnerable, strong uh, human being, therapy is where I, work through the issues that my story brings up right yeah no that's that's really helpful and it's interesting really thank really you Thanks, Karen. yeah way, no I worries think, i think that adoption is the greatest thing that a human being can do for another whether you like your parents or not and it's this reason it's because a child will test you emotionally a child will test you politically so i will test you financially a child will test you spiritually, they'll get right. And if you, if you, um, if you've got a weak spot, say it's like your father or your mother or what have you, it's your child that will say, say it's your mum, right? It's your child that says, Ganma, I love Ganma. Ganma uh, is good, you are bad. <laughs> if money is your issue, you know, whether you've got it or not. If money is, if you have a thing about money, whatever, it's your child that will say, give, give me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. Cool. It, I want it, you know. Yeah. The child will always push your, so that's why adoption is the greatest thing that a human being can do. That's cool. People will tell me, you know, somebody will say to me, well, I love my foster, my adopted parents. Rightly so. Somebody will say, I hate my adopted parents. I'm like, so what? You're like, you're like other people who are birthed. Cool. Anyway, blah, blah. Cool. Thank and you. Thank thanks, you. Karen. Thank you very much for getting us going. I'm going to go now, if I can, to David Yelland. I uh, know name. Are you there, David? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Hi, David. I just really liked the comment that you put um, in the chat a little bit um, of time before. And you're adopted too, it says. Yes, I am. Yes, um, I am. Yes. <laughs> um, no, it, it's such an. Uh, it's difficult to listen to 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 them with 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 dry eyes, to be honest. You know, and I've read the book and listened. You know, he he he, he speaks. I've never read anybody who writes so beautifully about what it's like to read about yourself in professional papers, by which I mean social services papers. My story isn't like yours, um, but uh, I, I know what that's like. And it's like looking at yourself from very high up, you know, it, it's a very um, difficult, you know, and um, um, but anyway, I'm trying to think of what to say. 
I mean, I, 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 I so agree with what you say. I know a lot of adopted people. Um, I, one of the things about my life is I, I uh, was and am an alcoholic. And uh, I, this, this next week, I'll, I'll be 15 years uh, over. And it's a big part of my life. And I, know I spent a lot of my life being very angry. Um, I was in the newspaper business where I was paid to be angry, actually. <laughs> that was, that was a, and that's a long time ago as well for me now. Um, but I think that, that you know, your, your, what you just said Lem, about adopting a child being the greatest gift, that, in my parents, is very old now, up in Yorkshire. Uh, and um, it wasn't easy. You know, I had nothing in common with my parents. Um, But it, but but thank God, you know, because the, the life I would have had, you know, was full of active addiction. Actually, addiction yes. in my blood. But I was brought up in a very boring northern family in Yorkshire, uh, which, which was the saving the, the saving grace of, of me. But your life, Len, your life is just mar a marvel. What you have achieved. But the most important thing, if I, if I may say so, that you've achieved is your happiness. It radiates out of you, and that is that is a gift to all of, all of us that, that, that see you and, and read you. Um, and that will be a legacy that will go on forever. You know, that, that, that is just extraordinary. And uh, so it's a, it's a, I really want to come on tonight and just say hello. And, and uh, because I've been so moved by um, what you've done for such a, a long period. So thank you. Thank you so much, David. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sure our paths will cross, Mr. Yelland, and um, and I've read you as well. And, uh, um, and well, I am a Man City fan, so I'm up there quite a lot. Now, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I'm down here. I'm, I'm I'm in London. I should I should say that actually. But, yeah. um, thanks, David. Um, no. I'm always nice to hear um, praise for boring Yorkshire families because I'm a product of one of those as well. I'm just going to ask a question um, that my boss um, Katie has put in the chat I just think is interesting. I'd, she says um, choice is an interesting concept you don't get to choose your family in brackets she says as her mother corrects her grammar as she is typing <laughs> <laughs> but family have unspoken truths we have your back we get a sense of identity, love is unconditional, some of the things you said. She asks, who has your back, Lem? Do you have, in the book you say a lot, you know, I've got no one, I've got no one, but who's, who's got your back now? Oh, well, I mean, I think I've made, I, I, I don't subscribe to the National Treasure. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, sort of, it's, it's, it's been mentioned a few times, which is beautiful, but it's not, it's, I know National Treasures and I think, no, that's what a National Treasure is. <laughs> um, but, but I do, sorry, I shouldn't, you should always take a compliment, you know what I mean? You should always take it and just don't try to deconstruct it when somebody's been... I think it's intended in all the best ways, to be fair. Yeah, no, it's actually on my book as well, on the back of my yeah. book. And I, I had words with my publisher about mm -hmm. that, but anyway, I Why did. Why do you feel funny about being a national treasure? That's interesting. Um, I think, um, well, I think now we're starting to, now I need a session. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think actually accepting um, a grace you know, accepting with grace um, is something which we all have to get used to in for our different reasons, and um, it's possibly connected to that. It's simply a compliment, and and uh, you know, who, so what? Whether it's wrong or not, you know, it's a compliment. If somebody said, you know, you're a shining light, well, I'm not a shining light, am I? So why would I, you know? So you just accept what you know. Yeah. So. I tried <laughs> Who's got your back? Tell us who's got your back. Um, I, well, I've been, you know, I've been, the truth is that I have, you've got to laugh at this and that's fine, but I believe in a higher power. I believe that there is something, it doesn't matter what it is, but I believe there's something that looks after, that, that something just bigger than us all mm. and bigger than me and I'm sorry to give you an abstract answer but it's not abstract to me mm. um, is that whatever that higher power is it has got my back mm. 
It's a great answer. It's not a, not a shirky answer at all. That's brilliant. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to go to I Polly. Agree. To <laughs> Polly's got a little blue hand up. Polly, are you there? Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi, Polly. Um, so I work for Tortoise and last year um, uh, the family, one of the founding editors of Tortoise, James Harding, invited, um, asked me to look at the whole issue of family separation in the UK and how the state decides to make um, those very, um, you know, the most important and serious decisions for vulnerable children. Um, and to remove um, them from their families. Um, and I'm now actually on book leave at the moment, writing a book on the same subject. And really for me, um, after spending kind of last year um, talking to people involved in the whole child protection system and the court system in multiple different ways, what I've really come to see is that the this is the kind of pinnacle of our relationship as citizens with the state. This is the kind of, the, the moment of failure on the part of the state or a family where the social contract needs to kick in. And what I wanted to ask you in relation to that is, did you feel uh, a relationship with the state as corporate parent, or was it all social workers? And did you feel like the state had your back as, so as a child. The evidence is in the book and it, the evidence is in the court case and you know and the evidence is in the uh, psychologist reports that had to be made on me when I took the government to court. Um, they did not have my back. Mm -hmm. They had the back of the institution that they were in. I've got to say there's great work that goes on in social work great work so I you know I gave the keynote address to the British Association of Social Works 50th anniversary this year I say that because um compassionate critique is what's needed and out in society there's a general hatred for kids in care in general um but also for social workers and for this for the social services and it's because both of them are a reminder that dysfunction is at the heart of all functioning families. And that reminder is a threat to the PR company of family. The PR company of family says, there is no dysfunction in our family. Actually, it's in all families. So no wonder we're supposed to be ashamed if we have been in care in any way. We're ashamed if our parents are not our actual blood. This is really, we're supposed to be ashamed, I say. This is really important because this all leads to the uh, disconnect between state and child who comes into its care because I think the state holds those prejudices as well. Mm -hmm. In other words, if there is an unspoken prejudice against a child in care, then that prejudice is in the state systems as much as it's in the villages. Mm -hmm. And the idea that a child in care is somehow a threat to, the, to, to, to a problem to be solved, to be passed from one person to another who can fiddle with them and try out their newest experiment on, on childcare with them and not take examples from... from a collective pool of good ideas of what good practice in family is. In other words, I wish that a child came into care and that all of the good practice that would happen in a family would happen in, with that child when he comes into care. Unfortunately, when a child comes into care, they get all kinds of like dodgy practice. They got put with foster parents who will turn around and say, this is challenging. You didn't tell me this would be challenging. And then there comes a question, why are we not training the foster parents? And it goes on and on. The dysfunction just goes on and on and on. And I am not concerned with successful fostering. That, you know, unless, other, other than using it as an, an example for more successful fostering. Mm. If a child, if one child is in care and is 
uh, distressed due to the, a dysfunctional, bureaucratic, politicized care system, then we have to stand up for that one child. We're not going to stand up over the child and say, look, all the rest is doing really well. You know, let's not look at this. Let's look at the good that we're doing. It's a very long answer and convoluted. But, um, do you think, Lem, do you think it, do you think it's got better since when you were little? There is no child in care at the moment who will find any value in the answer to that question. Mm. You can't go to a child who's in care right now and going through some of the things that they're going through and say, well, it's better than it was. Mm. No. So, no. So there's, there's not much purchase in my answer to you. Mm. However, I know that we are more aware of the care system of children in care now than ever in my lifetime. You know, David Cameron spoke about uh, children in care in his conference speech in 2012, I think it was. Um, Oxford University has recently announced millions uh, of new scholarships for working class kids and made a point of saying also for care leavers. Um, I just was at a meeting the other day with Andy Burnham, uh, and uh, housing organisations from Manchester. One in five, they own one in five uh, of the houses in Greater Manchester. And we were speaking, Andy was speaking about helping care leavers specifically with funds and resources through housing and all of the departments. There is a lot happening at the moment. Uh, and it's, it's really exciting, actually. And I think I've been part of that in some sort of outsider uh, out, outlier sort of way. I want to just um, mention, thanks Lem, uh, Tanya's this post in the chat and I did want to make sure I mentioned it because it, until I researched I'm um, getting ready for this evening I didn't know about it. Um, the um, Goldstone Foundation which, which you set up specifically yeah. for care leavers, there's a yeah. moment for a child who's been in care where they sort of drop out of care and, and, and the Christmas dinners thing is a thing that you know, it's a refrain in the book, birthdays and Christmas is particularly painful. Just tell us a little bit about it, just so people know, because I think it's really the Christmas dinners. Um, I, I, I wanted to set up an organisation that had no boss, that was, um, that was not empirical, that had no office, but they had to set up a Christmas dinner on Christmas Day for care leavers that had accredited kitchens, top staff, uh, DBS checks for everybody, um, standards as high or higher than would be in the care service um, that was non-institutionalized and this steering group would there would be no boss and they would begin meeting in September and by Christmas Day they would have to have a venue, uh, volunteers, uh, great meal and presents and top presents. Good stuff. And the idea was made, the idea was to make a Christmas that the young people who just left care could look on the next year and think, ah, oh, that was wonderful. What a great day we had. Our primary purpose is just to give to them, to serve them. Okay? So it's not herding cats. It's not the, I, I love crisis at Christmas, but it's not that. It's not soup bowls. It's not, you know, the volunteers are no better than the people that they're serving. Mm -hmm. We call them guests on the day. Yeah. There, are no, there are no name badges. Yeah. There's absolute attention to detail. Um, and, and, and we work with social services around the country. Every penny goes to the Christmas dinners. There's no workers. There's no offices. Mm -hmm. So the charity, we, we raise money to go straight out. There's no, it's the most beautiful thing. Brilliant. It's brilliant. People they, have a really good do, really good day. Yeah, and they have a great day and they have a memory. And you, you can go online and see videos on YouTube if you put in Christmas dinner and my name, and then you'll see some of the testimonies from the young people. Um, there were 17 last year, all over the United Kingdom. Brilliant. And one was organized uh, by one person just asking another, do you want to meet up and do this crazy project? Mm -hmm. And another, and another, and then, 10 people meet over Christmas, over winter, every couple of weeks. You know, notes go up in shop windows and um, 
you know, have you got this? Have you got that? Do you know a chef, etc. Brilliant. What yeah. a brilliant thing. I'm going to go to Lucy, Lucy Huberman, who's a bit of a regular on Tortoise Thinkings. Are you there, Lucy? Hiya. Nice to see you. Hi. Hi, Lucy. Hello. I'm a mum of an adopted daughter, which is lovely. Um, but many, many years ago, I first tried to adopt um, in Camden. I wasn't very young then. I was in my late 20s. And um, I was told I couldn't adopt because I was too old, too white and too middle class, basically, at the time. So that's a long time ago. What, what years was that? What's, what's um, oh, decade? That's, you know, now you're going to work out how old I am. So no, no, no. that's about 30 years ago. About 30 years ago. Just, was it 80s? No, it was in the, um, I think then, uh, yeah, the nine, early 90s, 90, yeah, 90s, yeah. Because in the 1980s, there was a place in Islington, just around the corner from you, called the Children's Legal Centre. I don't know if you came across it, but the Children's Legal Centre housed an organisation called the National Association of Young People in Care. And they were mainly young people in care. And they did a lot of lobbying and a lot of the stuff that's happening for children in care today can be stemmed back to the children's rights movement by oh, good, yeah. actual children in care and children who left care. There's a great book by a, uh, a man called Mike Steen from Leeds University called Care Less Lives, Care Less Lives. And that book charts the children's rights movement by people who were in the care system. And and they, one of the things that came out of that was blackening care. And at the time, a series of young people had come out of care. So if you, if you work back, that means that we were fostered or in the care system from the 60s. So we were 18 and 86, 85, 86. So in our 20s, we were in Islington lobbying for more black social workers, more black adopted in parents because there weren't any and that meant that somebody mustn't be looking for them. Yeah. But adoption actually is part of, uh, well, it's actually part of all of our cultures, to be honest. Yeah. Never, it's never not happened. Um, so, be, so all kinds of uh, uh, policies uh, were incorporated into various social services, especially London regarding finding same race, similar placements. Now, I know too many brilliant people who've been adopted by um, white middle class or working class people. I know too many to, know, to, to say that it doesn't work. For me to say it didn't work, they would have to vanish. Jackie Kay would have to disappear from being the poet laureate of Scotland, you know. Um, but it's difficult to give birth and many people who give birth have miscarried. So I, I think it would be difficult to adopt, sorry to say that out loud, but to, it's difficult to adopt and also yes you can be turned down. Um, thanks Lem and thanks Lucy. Um, I want, want to just, while we get into the last 10 minutes, um, to take a slight um, turn. Yeah. I, really like to talk about the arts a bit and writing oh, yeah. you're a writer performer artist and what have you um i forget where i read this this is my um poor research but you you said the creativity is the heart of what it means to be human and we've been doing quite a lot of work recently at us particularly about education the future of education obviously the chancellor of manchester university i wonder if you have thoughts about um while we're talking about kids and how they develop and what they learn and us collectively looking after children collectively's development. Do you, do you have a feeling one way or the other about um, the teaching of, let's say, poetry in schools? Yeah. Like, <laughs> first I want to just, can I just answer Polly's question? Oh yeah, of course. I feel like I just went out on a, on a limb and just, found myself up my own cul-de-sac. Um, and I, I think the question was something about kids in, do kids in care get service when they come into care? Was that it? Polly, are you there? Can you just unmute Polly? Yeah, hang on. 
on mute. There you are. Um, the question was really around um, the bit I'm, I'm really interested in is is the relationship between people and the state and imagine in your experience having read your book it was very much about the social workers who are kind of on the front line of that but did you have a kind of a conception of the state as as, as kind of corporate parents um i all i knew about the state and i lost respect for it as i was in it and i didn't think of it as a state i just thought you workers don't care i'm going to disappear and you're never going to call me so the one thing I knew about the care system was that none of the individuals that were in it were going to call me. I had, I had very little perception of the state. And I think it's a very good question because I, I've met young people who are in care at the moment who try to articulate emotionally what a corporate parent is. And I find that mainly it's, it, it, it irritates them. It irritates them emotionally, but this, that's just anecdotal. Mm -hmm. It is not emotionally, you put those two words together, corporate and parent, and, and a child thinks a parent is a parent. Mm -hmm. You're then asking them to say, to think of the parent as a corporation with different facets that can serve the child. It's an impossible ask. Mm. Do, do you understand? A child who's actually come away from its parents is being asked to use the term corporate parent. It's not, it is not going to work emotionally. So I, I understand what you were, I, mm. I think I understand what you were getting at. And, but for the institution, sorry, I'm pointing, for the institution, the corporate, the idea of the corporate parent is the best thing to have happened in the care system since I was born. Because every different department of local government is thinking, how are we serving the child in care? That is the right thing. Mm, mm. But for a child to take on the idea of a corporate parent, is, it, it, it's not working. And I, in fact, I know that one of the ministers who, ended, who was the child minister, I've forgotten his name, he hated it. And said it, you know, it just, it just didn't sit right. But it sits right with the corporation. And this is one of the central problems of the care system. It can find systems which are right for it, but are actually wrong for the child in the terms of the language. I hear kids in care calling themselves LACs. Mm. How dare a child abbreviate, how dare them take on the idea that they should abbreviate themselves? Mm. It kind of sterilizes the story as well. Right. But, but we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater and there's never been a better, you know, cliche to use than that. Mm. We can't. The actual idea of the corporate per parent is brilliant. But tell that to a small 11 year old, nine year old kid. Mm. We are going to teach you that this is your, and, and, and a child can't understand that there are housing departments and education departments and blah. That was the worst thing about being in care was like, I was supposed to understand what, what I least needed, which was to understand bureaucracy and politics and institutions. Mm. I needed in care one person to travel with me throughout the whole journey. The one consistent thing I had in care is that everybody disappeared and often within a year. Mm. Everybody, friends, the children's home, social workers, and I was supposed to be of sound mind at 18. Mm. You know, so I, I, th I think it's a really good point that you've asked. I think it's a really big ask and we should ask ourselves why are we thinking, you know, that this is because now we've got money for being a corporate parent. Now we've got responsibilities for being corporate parent. Why do we use the same language in our institutions for the people we serve? It's not taxpayers' money, it's DHSS. Do you know what I mean? It, it's, the, 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 there's a disconnect when we actually get to the service user. There was a mother I was talking to um, this morning, um, a grandmother actually, who, very much like your book was talking about the complete disconnect 
between what she called the kind of paper trail version of her granddaughter, she was a special guardian, and, and the child that she knew, and how different those versions were, um, and the skill it took to bring those together. And, and when it happened, it was so important. It was because a social worker got them. It was because a social worker had the skill to capture the complexity of their lives. But, but how on paper children are so often became a kind of caricature. Absolutely. The caricaturing of children is one of the, um, uh, it's all about love. Like how do we, how do we account for the great, uh, the greatness of love? Because remember that our care services, and we're always told, you know, we are not emotionally involved in this, in our cases. Well, that, that, is, an, that is an emotional statement in itself. Mm-hmm. You know, whenever a, a social worker would say to me, I cannot be, and I would ask, I cannot be emotionally involved in my work. I came to realize that that was an emotional state of being mm-hmm. in itself and, and a violent one to a child. So can you imagine as a parent saying to your child, I can't be emotionally involved in your upbringing. Imagine what that would do to your child. You know, why should a child in care feel any different? What, what, you know, how are we supposed to deal with that? And then have that replaced with the idea that we have a corporate parent. It doesn't work, you know, so... But like I said, the baby doesn't have to be thrown out with the bathwater, right? There's more happening within the corporations of local government than ever before for children in care. Um, and we will get it wrong before we get it right, I reckon. You know. like, like most parenting, by the way. Yeah. You don't know when you punish your children or when you, you know, you don't know if they're, they're, go- they're going to take your advice. You don't know if they're, do you know, most children who are taking drugs, drinking alcohol, staying out late at night, sleeping with each other inappropriately, stealing from local shops, they're not kids in care. Most children who do those things are your children. They're not, ch- they're outside of the care system, except for when your child steals a sweet from a shop or worse, smokes marijuana or drinks inappropriately, you don't call the police. You speak with yourself or your partner and you think, how are we going to get through this? And you hold on to the, to the boat as it rocks through the rapids and you think your entire life is going to fall apart because this child is going to ruin it for you and for themselves worst of all. But you try something and you've no idea if it'll work because you're frightened. When a child in care steals a sweet or smokes marijuana, the police are called, the report is written, the record is made. And worst of all, that child is already determined, is already seen to be traumatized. It's a bad system that doesn't take the examples from a functioning family. Lem, um, sorry. No, no, please don't apologise. It's um, kind of spellbinding listening to you, and it's and it's so important. And I think um, it's appropriate in a way that you were went back to address Polly's question because uh, we've we've done such a lot of work on on family separation and, and on kids in care in the system. It's an ongoing, you know, long term yeah. thing that as a journalistic organisation we're we're looking at and thinking about. And obviously, you come at it from a from a, from a different place, having experienced it and written about it. Um, Doesn't make you right though, does it? Uh, huh? I'm really interested in this idea that because you've been through an experience, it does not make you right. No. You know, you know what I mean? Like we, we're off, we're often do, we often do this, don't we? we? I'm not saying that you're doing it, but we go, this is an example of somebody who was in care and look, what, what, what did they say? And I realised at some point the power that that gives a person and how 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 um, tricky 
the example is, you know, I know you don't see me like that, and I know that's not why I'm invited here, but I have tried to keep myself out of the policy side of things and to look at it from the artist's perspective or personal perspective. I've tried to offer compassionate critique rather than to uh, beat up on social workers. Yeah, for sure. Because that, the, the social workers is in practice that children care gets. Why, this is why it's not a vote winner. And that's why my, I think my primary job is actually outside of the, the structures to raise the consciousness with the person on the street. And that's a big job. Yeah. Um, such and, a fascinating, yeah. Uh, we've had, um, we're two minutes over. Um, we could go on. I've got a thousand more questions. I wanted to talk to you about the arts. I wanted to talk to you about universities. I could, we could listen to you forever. So I'm so sorry, but we are going to have to say goodbye. And thank you so much to everybody who's contributed. Uh -huh brilliant stuff and Natasha's been amazing all kinds of things going on in the chat there's the book modeling it nicely his name is why um, um, it looks beautiful it suits you um, if you haven't read it I know I've said it a lot but it is absolutely riveting set aside an afternoon get yourself a cup of tea and a full packet of biscuits it's a it's a real page turner as well as being moving and important in all the ways we've said um, thank you so much to Lem um, it's been is the, the hour has gone like that um, and we've covered a lot of ground but I think people have really really enjoyed it it's felt very different this evening than some of the things that we have um, it's been amazing and all the very best to you I know you've had a bit of a rock and roller coaster of a day so you can have a nice chill evening I hope now and just wind down a little bit and enjoy yourself and to everybody else um, who's tuned in this evening thank you so much for being here um, we're back tomorrow lunchtime at Sortis if you fancy a crack at uh, gay rights and inequality in that space I'm going to have a go at that at one o'clock um, at lunchtime so have a lovely rest of the evening thank you Lem Find me on Facebook as well folks or Twitter and continue the conversation say hello and yeah. tell people about this if you've liked it so that you can come back to see more tortoise talks oh thank you lem um, and thank you to everybody else we would clap if we were physically together and all go and have a, a chat and hang out we can't do that because it's awkward on zoom so we're just going to do the awkward zoom wave oh uh, bye i'm so i'm so buzzed up <laughs> thanks very much i've loved you. this thank you. great questions <laughs>